Hello everyone, I'm Michaela Kathleen and this is my February reading wrap up. I read four books in February, starting with a little bit more of the complete works of Lewis Carroll, which let's see what I read in here. I read some of the poetry. So yes, I last left off with this ginormous book <laughs> with Sylvie and Bruno and Sylvie and Bruno concluded and then I took a little break and now this month I read Verse, The Hunting of the Snark, Early Verse, Puzzles from Wonderland, and Prologues to Plays, and now I'm taking another break before starting the Phantasmagoria, which is another long one. So yeah, as I have said in previous videos, I have been working on this book for literal years. It's pretty slow going for me. I don't really love it, which I suspected I wouldn't when I bought it because it's very old, obviously. But I was interested to read Alice in Wonderland and it's just so gorgeous. So I am kind of forcing myself to read it all the way through one time and then it will kind of more so just be a, a display piece. This was the first part of it that was not a story. It was mostly poetry and yeah, did not enjoy it any more than the stories. I didn't really enjoy it much less than the stories either, and I'm definitely not counting it as my trying poetry, because <laughs> yeah, it's just kind of old and it's a lot of nonsensical poetry, and I think it's probably just not my kind of poetry. <laughs> I just tend to uh, not click with older writing sometimes. But yeah, moving along, after that I read Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston, which I read for Black History Month. And this is, of course, a classic, but it is also, again, a little older. It's from the 1930s, so I was a little worried. And it's certainly not like a new top favorite, but I did really enjoy it. It had just some really beautiful, poetic, lyrical language in it, which I really loved. It is so quotable. And it's interesting because then all of the dialogue is written in dialect, so very jarringly different from some of the prose that's in the book. And the dialect definitely slowed me down, like you have to think about it a little bit more and take your time, but that was kind of a good thing too because, again, it, it makes you think about it more and it makes you like pay more attention to the story, I feel. But definitely I would not want that in like every book that I read because it makes for slow going. I really like it when books have like one or maybe two characters that kind of have a specific dialect because it really brings those individual characters live. But this was every character, which definitely gave the feel of like every character like being from the same place and everything, but it was just a lot of reading in a way that you're not really used to and it slows you down. But moving on to the book itself, it is kind of a look at racism and feminism in 1930s America, but like very much from the Black perspective. There are not a lot of white characters in the book at all, and there were some interesting looks at how all of the characters could be kind of prejudiced in their own way. For example, the book kind of covers the issue of colorism. There's a character in the book who is of mixed race and she really strongly looks down upon people who are fully black and really looks up to white people and really plays up that side of her heritage and thinks of herself as better because of it, which our main character kind of just puts up with and her love interest, it really makes him mad and he doesn't want to interact with this character at all. So it was just kind of an interesting look at colorism within the Black community. And it's also a deep dive kind of into the main character. Our main character is Janie and we really get to see her go on a journey throughout the book. She always, from the very beginning, is kind of willing to do what she wants, even if that kind of breaks norms, but she definitely starts out the book much more quiet and reserved and grows a lot and kind of finds her voice throughout the book. It starts off with her kind of being pressured into this marriage by her grandma, who really just wants what's best for her and wants her to be kind of protected, but Janie does not really love the man that she's arranged with and so she ends up leaving him early on for someone else and moving to a different town and kind of 
forging her own path. But she quickly finds that she really doesn't love the man that she has left with. She more so was just interested in getting away from the man that she was with. And you see her really kind of fold in on herself in this new marriage. But then, and this is kind of starting to get later in the book, so kind of into spoiler zone, but eventually her new husband dies and that's when she really starts to come into herself. She takes the time to really enjoy her freedom. Lots of people are pressuring her to get remarried and she just <laughs> totally turns down everyone until she meets the real love interest of the book, Tea Cake. And there is such an immediate difference between Tea Cake and every other male character that she interacts with. He really encourages her to speak her mind and sort of doesn't even let her go back to her old ways of just being this kind of shrinking flower who just goes along. And it's a really great romance, but still not perfect. Still realistic. They do argue throughout the book. There's a lot of jealousy. At one point, Tea Cake steals from her to go gamble her money, but then he pays her back, which he tries to kind of make it seem like it's all right since he paid her back, but really it's not. <laughs> and then he's all like, you can't spend your money anymore. I'm going to provide for you, which is also not great. She can do whatever she wants with her money. But overall, a great relationship and having those drawbacks, I think is really just realistic to life. And then at the end of the book, Janie is accused of a crime, which to try to be a little bit less spoilery, I won't say what crime. And I know there are some complaints that the book doesn't show Janie testifying for herself, but I was kind of okay with that because I feel like it's a very common thing in books if a character is relating what has already happened in the story to just kind of skip over that so as not to be repetitive. So I feel like that's mostly what was going on. And then also with her getting back to town and not explaining herself to the town. I feel like that was actually less so about her like still not using her voice and more so about her just no longer caring what people think. Like she doesn't have to explain herself and she just doesn't really let what other people are saying affect her. Whereas before she was kind of changing her behavior in order to like appease people and to have them not like treat or think of her badly and basically just not to not start fights and stuff. Whereas here, it's that she simply does not care what people think. So I really enjoyed this one. It was a very small book, but that covers an entire lifetime about some very interesting and deep topics and shown through some very poetic prose and well-drawn characters. The next book I read was Monday's Not Coming by Tiffany D. Jackson. And this book follows a teen girl whose friend has gone missing, but she seems to be the only one who cares and is kind of meant to highlight the issue of how young black and brown children often go missing and often their cases are overlooked. And I think my favorite thing about this book was the friendship between the main character and the girl who has gone missing. There are lots of flashbacks in the book that highlight their friendship and it is just such a realistic friendship and also one that I could really connect with because it was very similar to me and my best friend growing up. The main character is very shy and her friend is very outgoing and the main character sort of relies on her friend. She is her only friend. They are probably a little bit codependent and our main character's parents are a little worried that this is her only friend. The book had a little bit of a slow start but definitely as it went on tension builds and it gets like very frustrating in like a good way because I think you're meant to feel the same frustration that our main character is feeling about how none of the adults are doing enough or caring enough about our main character's friend Monday. And certainly tension builds around like the larger mystery of where Monday has gone but there are also a lot of like smaller mysteries that are sprinkled throughout which also adds a lot to the story, but it does get very repetitive. There are a lot of scenes of our main character running into Monday's sister and asking her where Monday is, going to the nurse and asking the nurse for help, going to her favorite teacher and asking her favorite teacher for help, and she will have multiple meetings with each of these characters 
trying to figure out where Monday is and they all start to feel very similar. And then, and this was a part of the all the little mysteries, sometimes characters would be talking to each other and you wouldn't really understand what they were talking about because you're kind of left out on some of the background information, which also got like a little annoying at times. So there were kind of the the frustrating parts where you didn't know what was going on and the scenes were a little bit repetitive. And then there was also, aside from that, kind of a confusing element in that the timeline of this book is a little strange and it makes it kind of hard to follow. Each chapter is either called the before or the after, and then there are other chapters that are like one year before the before or two years before the before. But the before, what I thought while reading the book, how it, how I was interpreting it as, was like our main character is worried about Monday, but doesn't, isn't really thinking of her as like missing yet, but she's kind of still like, I haven't seen Monday in a while, where's Monday? And then the after seems to be a little bit more pressing, like she actually thinks that like Monday's missing. And so I felt reading it like the before should be like before she she is looking for Monday and the after should be like she knows what's happened or the before should be like she doesn't even know Monday's missing and the after should be like she knows Monday's missing. A little bit more of a clear like cutoff point in the timeline to differentiate the two. Eventually at the end of the book the timeline is explained and it becomes very clear what the before and the after are, but throughout the book until that point, it, it's very confusing and kind of like, why has it been set up like this? It's, this is strange. Which does make it kind of a good book for rereading, I feel. I'm excited to reread this and know as I'm reading it what's going on. So like, it isn't a thing that like ruined the book. It just, early in the reading process, it's something you have to kind of just work through just be be comfortable with being confused. <laughs> but yeah, overall, an enjoyable read. I really enjoyed the characters' relationships, and there certainly was a lot of mystery. Whether or not the timeline works for you for you is like kind of individual taste. It certainly kind of gives you pause throughout the book, I guess, and it can be a little bit repetitive, but you definitely, I feel like, have the actual feelings that the main character is having of being very frustrated with what is going on. Which I think it's a, a good thing if a book can make you feel what your main character is feeling. And then the last book I read in February was Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, the illustrated edition. Which this was a reread, obviously. I kind of have a process that like every fourth book that I read, I do a reread and I kind of just jump from shelf to shelf, working left to right, um, and it was time for the Harry Potter shelf this month. And so at first I had been planning to reread The Cursed Child, <laughs> which I have mentioned in other videos, and it was kind of going to be like a see if it's really as bad as I remember, which I fully expect it to be kind of a thing, and I was maybe going to do like a rant review. But then one day I just randomly looked at the illustrated book and I wasn't sure if I had actually ever read this before or if I had just kind of gone through and looked at the pictures. And so then I was like, hmm, maybe I should read this. And I couldn't decide, so I did an Instagram poll and everyone voted for this. <laughs> and once I started it, I realized that I have in fact read the book from this edition before, but I had already done the Instagram poll, so I was sticking with it. Maybe next time I get around to the Harry Potter shelf on my rereading, I will do Cursed Child. And then after that, I think maybe I'll do the whole series. I didn't want to commit to the whole series right now. And yes, it probably takes me like two years to reread all the shelves. So yes, I am planning my reading like four years in the future at this point. But we're not going to worry about that. But yeah, on to the Harry Potter review. What to say about this book that has not already been said. First, I will talk about the artwork. First of all, the cover is so pretty. <laughs> but yeah, it's got really pretty artwork throughout... I'll just kind of show off some of my favorites. I really like this nearly headless Nick portrait. I don't like the art in here as much as the art in the Disney fairy books. I, that is my favorite artwork of all time, but it is nice. I don't plan on ever buying any of the other illustrated editions because that's just too much of a commitment. 
but I thought it would be nice to have the first book. I really love this portrait of Hogwarts because it reminds me of the poster from I think the Deathly Hallows part one where Hogwarts is on fire. I've always loved it. It's so pretty and also sad. <laughs> Obviously the school is not on fire here. It's just, I don't know, sunset. <laughs> and then this one is a small one and I don't particularly think it's the most pretty one necessarily, but it's got some hidden details and that's fun. <laughs> it's got like the hopping pot from Tales of the Old Bard, Deathly Hallows symbol, a mandrake, and the um, Babbity Rabbity Stump, I think, from Tales of Beetle the Bard. So yeah, just kind of fun to be able to spot little hidden details, which I feel like more of the more of the drawings could have had those. And then this page is fun, again, not because the artwork is like the prettiest in the book, but because there's just really funny details about trolls on this page. And then I really love this interpretation of the snitch. I think the mechanical bits are so cool. And finally, I love this two-page spread of the Forbidden Forest with a unicorn in it. <laughs> so pretty. So yeah, with this edition, it's just really nice to be able to appreciate the artwork. I also had forgotten that this edition is in like the original British text of the book, which has very, very small differences between the British and the American. But one of the ones that I like that's funny is Dudley's first word. In the American edition of the book, his first word is won't, but in the British edition it is shan't. <laughs> but yeah, these are just always fun to reread. I will say that at this point I know them so well that I can kind of think the lines, especially towards the beginning of the book, before I actually read them because I just know what they are, which is a little bit of a weird experience while reading. But yeah, I just uh, know the story so well. I remember I used to not really like the chapter where Harry receives his letters because I always felt like it was long and dragged on, which I don't find as much nowadays, which is an experience I had rereading The Inheritance Cycle this last year. I would read chapters that I remember as a kid thinking were so long and boring and dragged on so much, but now as an adult I'm like, this isn't bad at all. I definitely feel like it starts to get the feeling of warmth and home and like I'm back in my favorite book world when the Weasleys show up. <laughs> That's when it really starts to feel like, oh yes, I'm reading Harry Potter. Because obviously the time at the beginning of the books with the Dursleys is never much fun. I also feel like as an adult now, I really appreciate how sweet Harry is like how he feels such empathy for the snake at the zoo and is just immediately so nice to Ron and really everyone he meets and he's always like trying to make people feel better if he feels like something bad has happened for them. He's just really a sweetie and it's something that I don't think I paid much attention to as a kid. But my favorite chapter in the whole book for the first book is The Mirror of Erised. I love that chapter so much. And I really enjoy Quidditch. I know some people find the Quidditch parts to be very boring. I do not. It is the only sport that I like. And the troll chapter is great. I cannot believe that the editors wanted to cut that chapter. <laughs> to me, it is very action-packed. And yeah, unlike the beginnings of the books, I usually always really enjoy the endings. I enjoy the chat with Dumbledore that happens at the end of most of the books. And I feel like they're always like pretty succinct, like they don't drag on, but they're also always just so nice. <laughs> and yeah, that was kind of my my reread experience of the first Harry Potter. It was fun to kind of dip my toes back into the wizarding world for a hot second <laughs> and to now just be moving all right along. <laughs> I'm very excited that next month I'm going to be doing all feminist reads for Women's History Month. But these are the four books that I read in February. Let me know down below what you read in February and if you read any books for Black History Month. Thanks for watching. Remember, words matter.